This morning we're going to talk about go fish. Well, I'm just curious. The child's card game, go fish. If you played that when you were a kid, would you raise your hand? Wow, a lot of you did. So I don't have to tell you how to play it. I have a kind of idea though that younger folks haven't been introduced to the game like us older folks. Now there's so many screens that kind of takes the place of an old fashioned card game called Go Fish. Well, the rules kind of vary depending upon the version of the game that you're playing. You can play it with face cards or you can play it with specialized Go Fish cards that may have kind of funny characters on them. But basically it works like this. Each player gets so many cards, anywhere from maybe five to seven cards. And the object is, is either making pairs or four of a kind of one of those cards. And say, so you've got a nine. And you want more nines. So you say to the player, give me your nines. If they have a nine, they've got to give it to you. If they don't have a nine, they look you square in the eyes and say, go fish. And so you pull a card from the deck. Now if they got a nine, then you could choose another number and turn to another player and say, give me your eight. And if they don't have an eight, then it's once again, let's go fish. And so you try to make those pairs or those four of the kinds, depending on what version of the game that you're playing. It's a good game for kids. Good game for parents to play with their kids. But I want us today to think about something more serious than a card game. But I want us to consider some elements of that card game with a greater task of fishing for the souls of men. Read in your presence already, Matthew chapter 4, verses 18 and 19. And there, of course, these disciples told, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. In Luke chapter 5, in verses 10 and 11, once again there, we find these words, Do not be afraid. From now on you will be catching men. Now this was in a context where Jesus had told Peter to go out into the deep and fish. He fished all night and caught nothing. He was the fisherman. You know, Jesus was the carpenter. But he said, nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. And he had a tremendous catch. And then Jesus says, from now on you will be catching men. Fishers of men. In the Great Commission you read, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations. Now okay, you don't find that word fish there, but I think you could say what he's saying is go fish. As concerns this game, there's several elements that I think could pertain to our fishing for men. And that first thing is, you must ask for what you want. Like I said, say you've got one nine and you're wanting to make a pair or you're wanting to get the four of a kind on the nines, you got to ask, give me your nines. Well, as concerns asking, let me say this. First, ask God. We find there in Matthew 7, 7 and 8, those three words, ask, seek, knock. And while this could have broad application, certainly its first place application would be ask God, seek God, knock on God's door. Are we asking God when we're thinking about the fishing for men? In James chapter 4 verse 2 you read, For you do not have because you do not ask. Once again, we're talking about fishing and asking. Let's start with asking God. We find this is exactly what happened in Acts chapter 4. Read out Peter and John. They had been in jail. They had been in prison. They had been incarcerated because they had been preaching in the name of Jesus Christ. 
and Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Well, they were let go. They went back to the disciples, joined again with them. And then in verse 24, a prayer is begun. And they start out, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them. Then you get to verse 29 and you read more specifically. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness. See what they were asking God for? <laughs> Interestingly, didn't ask God for these, these folks and their threats. Bridle their mouths. Tie their hands and keep them from placing us in prison. Didn't say that. God, let us keep being bold servants to preach. That's what they asked for. As Paul was writing to the church of Colossae, he said, pray also for us that God may open to us a door for the Word. It wasn't just there. Paul prayed. He said, you pray for me. But here's what I want you to pray for that a door would be open for the Word of God. They wanted opportunity to teach and to preach. And as we think about asking, seriously, number one on the list, ask God. There's a song sometimes we sung, Lead me to some soul today. Oh, teach me, Lord, just what to say. I would hope that all fishing for men begins with God. No, we don't fish for God, but we need God's blessing in that fishing, don't we? And so it was. Yeah, we see the disciples praying Acts 4. Paul asking the brethren, Colossae, you pray. Ask God. I saw this. It said, most people will attend church if invited. Well, I'll admit, I saw that and my kind of response was it was, huh? I'm not sure how true that is. But I know that it is unlikely your friends or acquaintances will be sitting next to you on Sunday unless you invite. That's right. There's a place for us asking Asking someone to come worship. Don't be discouraged when they don't come. My experience is you have to ask a lot of folks for that one to come. But keep asking. Don't quit. Don't stop. I'm convinced of this. You ask enough. Somebody will come and worship with you. So yes, you'll be asking about worship. In Isaiah chapter 2, a prophetic verse about the church. Down in verse 3 you see, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that He may teach us His ways that we may walk in His paths. It's almost like here an invitation. Come! Let us go up to the mouth of the Lord, to the house of Jacob. So we need to be saying to others, Come! Let us go up to the mouth of the Lord, to the house of Jacob. In John chapter 1, beginning in verse 45, we read, Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found Him of whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said to Him, Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Philip said to Him, Come and see. You know, we need to be telling to our friends, Come and see. We need to be asking. As you get over to John chapter 4, 
We looked at this just a few weeks ago, this story of Jesus and the Samaritan woman at the well. And to me, it's one of those exciting stories uh, of Jesus and an encounter with someone because you've got a little more detail to the whole thing. It's not just one verse or two verses. It's almost the entirety of the chapter dealing with it. And so here this woman at the well. She's alone. She's alone. That's unusual that she's not with the women in the morning coming out. But now it's noon and she's coming out to the well by herself. And Jesus uses this as an opportunity. He even tells us some things about herself that how would he know? In other words, there's some miraculous knowledge of Jesus used at that point. Then it says, So the woman left her water jar and went away into the town and to the people. I suggest to you this says she's excited. She's come with her water jar to get water. And she leaves her water jar and goes back to town. She's excited about what she's heard. And then she shares with the town. She says, Come see a man who told me all that I ever did. Could this be the Christ? You know, she kind of, like Philip says, come and see. Then they went out of the town and were coming to him. Once again, I suggest, let's be like this woman here and say to our friends, come see. We need to be asking. We need to be asking God first. Then next, we need to be asking others. And one thing that we need to be asking is, Will you come and worship with me? But I suggest to you that there's more than we need to do than just be asking, will you come and worship with me? We need to be asking others to study the Bible with us. You know, what do you want for him or her? What do you want for the people you meet? What do you want for the people you know? What do you want for your family, your aunts, your uncles, your cousins? What do you want for your friends? What do you want for your neighbors? I have an idea that what you really want more than anything else, I would hope this is what you want, is for them to become a Christian. For them to be saved. Have their sins washed away, forgiven. How do you get to that point? Where they become a Christian, where they are saved. Well, among other things, yes, there's the grace, the mercy, the blood of Jesus. There's the faith, repentance, confession, and baptism. All these things go into and are a part of our sins being forgiven. We become a Christian and we become saved. But we would also see a, a primary element of this is it's by the Word of God. Now we can look at a number of passages. just want you to look at this one. 1 Peter 1, verses 22 and 23. Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth. So notice here the place of the truth or the Word of God in this. Jumping down to verse 23, since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding Word of God. So when I think about all of these things that bring me to salvation, I understand one very, very important element God's Word. God's grace, God's mercy, God's love, the blood of Christ is there. It's done. It's waiting. But how will I know about it without the Word of God? How will I come to faith without the Word of God? How will I know how to repent? What to repent of? What repentance is without the Word of God? How will I know to confess that name of Christ and be baptized for the forgiveness of sins without the Word of God? God's, once again, God's grace, God's mercy, God's love. He's fair, it's waiting. I've got to bring my friend, my neighbor, my relative to the Word of God. I learn about it, to know about it. So we need to be asking, will you study the Bible with me? So we got to first ask as we consider the go fishing game and the serious nature of fishing for souls. A second thing about that game is you can only ask for what you have. You use that illustration of nines. The, the child says, do you have any nines? 
Well, they only ask that because they have a nine themselves. Wanting to add to it. You can only ask for what you have. We must be asking others that which we already have ourselves. If we ask someone to come worship with us, are we ourselves attending worship faithfully? You know, my, my desire for you would be asking your friends to attend worship with you. But also my desire is, in the first place, you be attending worship faithfully yourself. And I think that kind of makes sense, doesn't it? And so he asked someone to study the Bible. I hope you do that. But if you're going to do that, shouldn't the prerequisite be your, you, you yourself are already studying the Bible? Bible reading, Bible study is a part of your life. The only way you can really legitimately ask anybody, come worship with me. You're there. Come study the Bible because you're already worshiping yourselves. You see, you're, and it's just asking, please become a Christian. Live a Christian life. But are you a Christian? Or are you living the faithful Christian life? We can't really ask it. Oh, well, we can. But it doesn't have a lot of meaning if we're not ourselves living the faithful Christian life. We must have for ourselves what we are asking of others. Look at 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and with respect. Look at it. You got this hope first in you. That's why you can share that hope. That's why you can ask people to come worship you. That's why you can ask people to study the Bible with you. That's why you can ask people, please become a Christian. Because you've got that hope in you. We must have ourselves what we are asking of others. Next, you know this little game. You must ask before others ask. Okay, we use this illustration of nines. You got the nine. You'd like to make a pair or four of a kind of nine. So you ask someone for the nines. You need to ask for the other guy did. Somebody might think, wait, wait, wait. Fishing for men. Are other people fishing? You know they are. You know they are. The atheist. There are evangelistic atheists. When I was, after my junior year in high school, I went to the University of Alabama that summer to take lab science. We lived close enough to campus that I could hear what would happen in Bryant-Denny Stadium. And so I thought, living this close, why don't I just go ahead and get an early start? Went to, University of Alabama that summer went back to high school my senior year. My first class was biology for biology majors. That teacher who taught that class, and it was hard, by the way, it was hard. He, he, he let it be known he believed in something. He never really was specific. But it sounded like he believed in something. But then the next term, I had biology for non majors. That was easy. That was a good part about that class. But that teacher was an evangelistic atheist. He, he let it be known in no uncertain terms. He did not believe in God and that he would be happy if he could lead you to not believe in God. The atheists are seeking converts. Muslims Yes, they're seeking converts. Hindus are seeking converts. Coming back from Ukraine many years ago, 
when we would fly through Austria, there in the Vienna airport, there's this kind of a hub at one place and several major flights to the U.S. and elsewhere were out of that little hub. And people were just crowded in there, just almost elbow to elbow at some points. And I'd speak to people around me and spoke to this young lady. She was probably in her 20s. She was coming back from India, going back to the United States. What'd you think about India? Loved it. What'd you go there for? To learn about Hinduism. And all I can think of, what in the world? Somebody raised in the United States with churches on every corner and they're seeking out Hinduism? Yes, Muslims, Hindus, other religions, they're seeking converts. Various denominations are seeking converts. And I can promise you this, in the, Old, in the New Testament, the scribes and the Pharisees were seeking converts for they traveled across sea and land to make a single proselyte, Matthew 23, 15. But we could also even say this, Satan is seeking converts. The God of this world has blinded the eyes of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. We find further in 1 Peter 5, 8, be so reminded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Others are seeking converts. We need to be asking first. When I was a sophomore at Alabama Christian College, now Faulkner University, I was running for an office. Had, had, had been one of the class officers the year before, and now instead of being treasurer, I was going to run for the president of the class. I lost. But that's kind of beside the point. But I asked a lady, I guess you say lady, she's another student, young lady, I, will you vote for me? No. Well, I just had the gall to say, why not? The other guy asked me first. You know what? That's what sometimes happens is, is somebody else gets there first. We need to be asking before others. Another thing is you consider this card game. You must ask different people. You ask one person. You got nines, they say go fish. Well, guess what? Next time, I need to ask somebody else. Do you have nines? And you find, as it were, when you turn to the Bible, Paul, he was preaching to Jews. Then he went to Gentiles. Acts chapter 13, verse 46. And so we need to realize there's others. Note the parable of the wedding. Call those who were invited to the wedding feast, but they would not come. So they invited some, they wouldn't come. And then he says, go therefore to the main roads and invite the wedding feast as many as you find. So you, you invite these. And now you invite everybody else. You've got to be asking. Asking others. And then you need to be sometimes, yes, even asking more than once. In this little card game, you know, somebody you may ask for nine. I don't have any nines. Go fish. Well, guess what? In the process of the game, they've had to go fish, probably. Maybe now they've got a nine, and so you might ask them again. You got any nines? Well, you may ask somebody to worship. You don't get a good response this time. Don't let that be the last time. Ask again. We never know if their mind might change. Their position or their place in life changes. Their heart may be changed in some fashion and they be receptive. If we never ask again, more likely they don't come. You know, Luke chapter 18, verses 3 through 5, of course, this is in the context of prayer, but it's the story of the persistent widow. Now, there was a widow in that city who kept coming to him and saying, Give me justice against my adversary. Then verse 5, Yet because the widow keeps bothering me, I will give her justice so that she will not beat me down by her continual coming. Well, I know sometimes we might think, well, I don't want to make a nuisance of myself. It almost sounds like she did. But we need to be persistent. It's not just ask once. You know, this is a, 
two special people to me, Austin and Margaret Graves. And I've told you about this before. Some of you, though, don't know it. But it's just one of the best examples I know of of somebody being persistent. And no, I'm not saying that Austin and Margaret were the persistent ones. But I'm thankful that they had a persistent neighbor. Austin had been raised with the truth, had obeyed the truth, gone into military service that for a time even. Austin and Margaret, and as they were young married, were living in Alaska, stationed there, before coming back to Alabama. And then found themselves here in Montgomery. But during those first years of being married, they weren't faithful in their worship. They got out of church, if you would. They got away from church. And to that extent, in that way, they were away from God. But if we were to fast forward, when I moved to Montgomery, he was an elder of one of the congregations here in Montgomery. He served then as a deacon at at least one or two other congregations during the course of those many years. And he endeared himself to very, very many. And I'm using the past tense because he's passed away. Margaret, she's still with us, but shut in. But if we were to say, how do we get from they're out of church and away from God to this faithfulness even to the point of leadership in God's church. They were living in Highland Gardens. They had a neighbor who was a member of Highland Gardens Church of Christ. And here would be Saturday. The neighbor would come over. Austin, Margaret! Would you go to church with me tomorrow? And they wouldn't go. And the neighbor would come back the next Saturday. Tomorrow Sunday, love if you'd go to church with me tomorrow. And on and on it went until finally they consented. And they went and they attended. And they didn't stop attending. If that neighbor had gone to once and knocked on the door and said, won't you come? We might say, come here, pat him on the back, you've done well. But what if they had stopped then? The story would be very different. We wouldn't have a church secretary because see, our church secretary is their daughter. What if they'd only come twice and knocked on that door? See, it took several times. Don't ask just once because you never know Maybe it's the second, the third, the fourth time that makes the difference. As we close, it's a little game for kids. Go fish. But the principles can certainly be applied to fishing for men. And I beg of you, as you're fishing for men, don't get discouraged. You never, never know what the invitation, what the asking for the Bible study, what the handing out an invite them card might do. It may be years later. It may be you never know that what you've done has made the difference. Don't get discouraged. Keep on. If we could assist you in your obedience this morning, there's a need in your life to be baptized for the forgiveness of sins, if you're that one of faith who's repented of sins, we'll give you that opportunity to confess that faith and assist you in baptism. If there's a need for prayer, we'll be glad to take that time and pray for you. If you need to come, please come as we